Now, could I turn to the Bible, please, to read from John's Gospel, please, chapter number three, first of all, chapter three of John's Gospel. And we read verse three, please, and verse seven. Verse three, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And verse seven, marvel not that I said unto thee, he must be born again. Now look over, please, to chapter number 19, the same gospel, chapter John's gospel, and chapter number 19, please, in verse number 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Now then back to John 3 for the verse number 16. I want to read, please. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And then finally, please, to the last book of our Bible, to Revelation, please, chapter number 21. Revelation and chapter number 21, verse number 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and the, the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Verse 4, but God, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Verse 8, These but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. In verse 15 of the previous chapter, we read these solemn words, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. We know that the Lord will add a blessing to these very familiar verses again tonight from the Bible. We have read words of John that we want to think about tonight. We have read from the gospel, of course, and we all know John wrote the gospel, guided by the Spirit of God, of course, and his three epistles, and of course then in Revelation. Very simply, I want tonight just think of different words or different things that John brings before us that we want to look at tonight very simply. First of all, John reminds us in chapter 3, there that simple fundamental truth of the necessity of the new birth for heaven. I know that has been often preached, but again, we want to just tell us what John brings before us concerning Christ as he speaks to Nicodemus, the absolute necessity of the new birth, we must be born again. Then we want to think of what we've read in John chapter 19, the sufficiency. John also writes in that beautiful chapter, John 19, I try and read John 19 every Sunday morning before I go out to remember the Lord, that delightful chapter, bringing before us the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, John's the writer that tells us about the sufficiency of Christ's death, John's the one that tells us about that great sixth cry of the Lord Jesus when he cried, it is finished. So we want to think of the sufficiency, not only the necessity of salvation, John writes about, but the sufficiency of Christ's death to meet the need of every sinner. And then, of course, John's the writer, and everyone <clears throat> likely, are very, we're all very fond of John's writings. It's all simple writings there in, the, in John, in, in the gospel. And then he gives us the simplicity of salvation. I wonder, is there anyone in the room tonight? And you have come to the room to get saved. Maybe throughout the week or whatever, you've longing for salvation and longing to be right with God and maybe confused about God's way of salvation. Well, John puts it into simple terms, how you can be saved. Listen to John's writing concerning Christ's words, of course. He says, whosoever believeth in him. There's the simplicity of God's salvation. Whosoever believeth in him, Christ, should not perish, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And then John's the writer, of course, in Revelation, when he brings before us words about eternity. John, John opens up to us the great eternity. He speaks about 
heaven, heaven forever, heaven for those that are saved. But then John also writes, but, see, not everyone will reach heaven. That's a sad thing dear people. I don't know how many's in the room tonight. I'm not sure how many's outside there, how many, if there's any in the car park or not. I don't know. But it's hardly likely that all under the sound of our voice tonight will be in heaven. That's a sad thing. John speaks about heaven. Gives us great details about it. Then he speaks about hell. He says, but they'll all not reach heaven. He says the fearful and the unbelieving and others, of course, he said, they shall have their part. Imagine, you know, those of us who are saved, we say, oh, shall I be? We sing often. And with anticipation, we sing, oh, shall I be amongst that throng? All clothed in robes of white and help to swell redemption's song in rapture and delight. And thank God we can sing with confidence tonight, I shall, for I have been redeemed. But there's some in the room tonight and you're not ready. And if you don't soon get saved, John wants you to understand this from the Scripture. You, when the saints are having their part in glory forever, John says, you, unbeliever, will have your part where? In the lake. That burn. I tell you, people, that is tremendously sad if there's one in the room and heaven's song will be going on forever. They would be having their part forever in the lake. You remember those little things, dear. Words that John reminds us and writes about words of necessity, words of sufficiency, words of simplicity, and also words about the great and never ending eternity. I know we have often read and I know you have all likely, all in the room here and all likely under the sound of our voice tonight, you've all likely heard these, these words before of the Lord Jesus as he spoke to Nicodemus. These words. Nicodemus had come to Christ. Nicodemus, there a man interested in eternal matters. There's a man likely had heard, had heard about this man, Jesus of Nazareth, and this man that could change water into wine and do different miracles. And others had come just out of curiosity. But I do feel that Nicodemus came with a genuine concern to get right with God. Genuinely wanting to be right for eternity. For the Bible tells us while there was multitudes at that time around Jerusalem, teeming multitudes of people, the Bible says in verse, the last verse of chapter 2, there was a man, there was one man, and his name was Nicodemus, and he came. It wasn't easy for him. Wasn't easy for this religious man, this educated man, this man that had reached the zenith, this man had, had achieved much, this man with great knowledge, this man knowing the scriptures, wasn't easy for him to swallow his pride as it were and come to Christ to inquire about these eternal matters. We think of the words, the first words that, that likely left the lips of Nicodemus on that night. He said to Christ, we know that thou art a teacher come from God and all that. No man could do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. I often consider Christ's plain words. To you know, would to God that I could denite with warmth and with weight and with plainness. Just speak these words. And they would reach your heart tonight, friend, if you're in the room without Christ. Listen to what Christ said. He said, Nicodemus, Nicodemus knew there was a kingdom. Nicodemus knew about heaven. And the Lord Jesus said, I know you want to be in it, Nicodemus. But he says, Nicodemus, if you want to be in it, you need the new birth. In other words, Nicodemus, no possibility, Nicodemus, none whatever, none whatever. I trust there's no one confused in the room tonight here in Ballyclare. I trust that you're absolutely convinced, not from John Rogers, but from that holy book, the Bible, that if ever you're going to be in heaven, you need a definite change. And you need the new birth. And you need to be born from above. Nothing else will do. We need to be rescued. The Bible tells us that we're all dead in trespasses and in sins. As we read in verse number 18 of this very chapter, each one in their sins condemned already in their sins and unfit whatever for heaven and only fit for hell. I tell you, people, that's a great lesson to learn. And I tell you, people, that's not easy to learn. And that's not easy to accept. And many people come to meetings. And we're not here to scold anyone. You know that. But many people come to meetings and they hear that and it just, it never registers with them that this is me, that this is my name, this is where I am. And Christ would say to you plainly, 
that if ever you're going to be in heaven, you need the new birth. You need to be born again. And it's a real thing, dear people, to be born again. I remember sitting at my father's knee and we were reared up away there, county down country. And I remember sitting at my, on my father's knee bit high and sitting beside him as I got a little older. And he would read to us from that scripture that I have read to you tonight, poured into our ear, the absolute necessity of being saved and being born again. Maybe some of you dear people have drifted further on than that. Maybe earlier days you thought about it. Maybe earlier days you maybe give it a little thought. But maybe as you have moved on in life, in life, you can listen to the teaching of Christ and really the truth of it and the reality never stirs you people. I tell you, be great. What a discovery that night for Nicodemus. What a discovery. I say to your people, what a discovery that night there speaking to Christ. I often think, you know, about Christ. You know, he would have spoken tender. He would have spoken softly and plainly. Likely, likely, likely with a tear in his eye as he thought of Nicodemus. Because Nicodemus, he must be born again. I would love to get close to those in the room tonight without Christ or wherever you're sitting, wherever you are. I would love you that you would hear those words, not from John Rogers tonight, but you would let them write them in your own heart and conscience this very night. The absolute, my necessity, my greatest need, my most urgent need, my real need, my absolute need is to be born again, is to be saved and to be rescued, and to have my sins forgiven. I tell you, people, if that were to grip you tonight, the way it gripped Nicodemus, you see, Nicodemus, when he heard that, he just drank it in the first time. Imagine a man, a man hearing just what you have heard, just how many times have you heard that? Many times have you clearly from the Bible been told ye personally must be born Again, many times, many weeks, many months, and many years. And yet, dear soul, you, you just drift on. Would to God tonight, friend, you would hear those words from Christ to your soul tonight, words of absolute necessity. If ever I'm going to be in God's heaven, I must, I must be born again. You know, the Lord Jesus emphasized that. As you know, John's the writer that tells us, and in those verses that we didn't read them all, but in those verses, three times over he mentions that. Three times over. You know, a threefold cord's not easily broken. Three times the Lord Jesus mentioned, verse 3, verse 5, and verse 7, that you must be born again. Go over to chapter 8. Three times again the Lord Jesus mentioned. It says, if you die in your sins, the seriousness of not being born again. Here's the serious thing, people. You're never born again. Here's what Jesus Christ said. He said, you'll die in your sin. You'll die in your sin. You'll die in your sin. And he says, where I am, you cannot come. Friend, learn, learn tonight, friend. I don't only mean learn it, but let, pay attention and let it in, friend. Let it in. This is absolutely important. There's nothing more important if you're not saved in the room tonight to understand this is what I need. The new birth, being born again. Then John's a writer, as I told you, he tells us about the Lord Jesus and the great sufficiency of his work at Calvary and the work that he finished in order that you and I might be saved. John's a writer again that tells us in chapter 3 and verse number 17, he says, God sent not a son into the world. God didn't send him to condemn the world. No, no. God sent him that you, Nicodemus, and I, that we might be saved. I hear our brethren, there must have been a nice morning meeting here this morning about the love of Christ. Must have been maybe one of the themes. And many of our dear brethren in the prayer meeting tonight was reminding us of, of, of the love of God and the love of Christ. And friend, we tell you again about God's great love for sinners and sending his son and God, Christ's great love for sinners. As we were saying tonight about going to the cross and dying for the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ here in chapter 19 of John. He comes out in chapter 19 in those early verses wearing a crown of thorns. There he stands. What a journey he had made from heaven, Bethlehem, all those different places he visited, all those different places where, where the Bible tells us he was, all the different things that we've done. And this is John, there he stands. Crown of thorns upon his head. 
Verse 17, then John tells us that he took his cross. Imagine, imagine Christ taking his own cross. And going out to John speaks about Golgotha, place of a skull. And there are two thieves crucified and Christ on the cross. And John tells us about the title. John tells us about his mother standing. And then John tells us about him crying on the cross, I thirst. And John, we know, understood that when the Lord Jesus Christ was on the cross, see the God laid on Christ. For he tells us in chapter 1, and he says, in verse 29, he says, Look, behold the Lamb of God. Why? Why? Why to look on the Lamb of God? Why? He says, He's the one that bareth away the sin of the world. And John's the writer that tells us that when he was on the cross, he bore our sins in his own precious body upon the tree. All our sins were laid on Christ. You think about that, people. John doesn't tell us about the dark hour. But John tells us that Christ cried, I thirst. Other writers tell us that when he was on the cross, he cried, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But then John tells us of that great cry. He cried, it is finished. Now, dear people, I want to stop here for a moment. And I want you to hear this word. Christ on the cross. God has laid on him the iniquity of us all. All our sins have been laid on Christ. He beareth away the sin of the world. Christ died on the cross there for our sins. And there was a moment arrived when God's throne was satisfied and everything was completed and all accomplished and everything was done. Listen to the cry, people. It is finished. It. Christ didn't say, I am finished. No, no. In perfect control, the work that he had come to do, that's what he tells us in the pre, in a few chapters before this. He says, I, Christ, have finished the work. And he finished the work. And he cried as finished. And I want to tell you, dear soul, it's sufficient. It's completed. It's accomplished. It's done. And everything the sinner needs, Christ has accomplished at the place which is called Calvary. And the poet pen, that when the Savior cried, it's finished. Everything was fully done. And the poet penned, he bowed. I love to think of Luke's, Luke's writings about the crucifixion. It says that after that, he, he says he bowed his head in perfect control, everything accomplished and everything done. He had come from heaven. He had arrived at Calvary. Those hours on the cross, he paid the price that God's thrown to man and he finished it. And he is so sufficient. And thank God the sufficient in the death of Christ to meet the need of every sinner. For someone, John, that's all good now. You've told us that our greatest need is to be born again. You've told us that Christ on the cross has finished the work and everything is done and completed and accomplished and paid. How do I make it mine? Anyone in the room interested in it? But listen to the words of Christ with simplicity of God's salvation to any soul in the room who would desire salvation. John 3 and 16, we'll just use the, 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 end, the end of that verse. It says, Whosoever believeth in him, who's friend, how you'll get salvation. Don't let anyone confuse you or deceive you. We need the new birth. Christ has sufficiently paid the price. Christ has taken the place of the sinner. Christ has died for sinners. And God's simplicity, simple plan of salvation is that whosoever believeth in him shall or should not, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Dear people, terrible thing to miss it, wouldn't it? You see, people sometimes are confused to say, I, I can't understand it, and I don't know how that all works. But here, dear friend, you, you think of it like this. God says that you and I need salvation. God has sent his son Christ, the Lord Jesus, and he on the cross has died for us. He has taken our place, wounded for me, the poet penned, wounded for me. And he was wounded there for our transgressions. He is bruised for our iniquities. Now, that, has, that work has satisfied God, and everything is completed and all is done. Do you think, friend, God would make salvation complicated that you couldn't get it? No, dear. Any complication, any difficulties, is all on your side. And here's what God would say to you tonight if you really want to be saved. He would say, Whosoever believeth in him, Christ, shall not perish, shall not perish, 
would have everlasting life. The poet pen, the trembling soul I sought the Lord, my sin confess, my guilt deplore. Then I say the, the, in the chorus, He took my place. He died for me. And whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Again in John 6 and 47, we read words like these. Verily, verily, now one of those verily, verily texts, 25 of them in John's Gospel, as you know. Verily, verily, truly, truly. I say, Christ says unto you, he that believeth in me, as Christ, hath everlasting life. I tell you so, the night I got saved, God, God, the, the work of Christ, the work of Christ, I appreciate it. But when the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross, he died for me. He bore my sins instead of me. That's what Christ has done for me. And God says to me, He that believeth, whosoever believeth in him, should not perish but have everlasting life. Don't let the devil deceive you, people. That salvation is beyond reach. It's available tonight. And it's through Christ. And it's Christ to do. I close with words of eternity. Revelation is a wonderful book. As I told you, it mentions heaven. It tells us about the city. Tells us about heaven's big place, beautiful place, busy place. But the big thing for, about heaven is that where Jesus is, there's heaven there. And what will make heaven for everyone that's saved is that they'll see the blessed man that took her place and died for it. And we'll appreciate it him forever. The Bible says we shall praise him. The Bible says that we shall look on him. The Bible says that we shall, as it were, forever praise him for saving a sinner like us. And we praise him and the song will be unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins by the shedding of his own most precious blood. Then it tells us all the other things that will not be there. No sin there, no separation there, no sorrow there, no tears there. All those former things passed away. Well, might we sing, what must it be to be there? Heaven. What about the lake? What about the lake? To everyone in the room here, everyone in this room and in the foyer and out in the car park, if there's anybody, everyone, every one of us. And you can bury your head in the sand and say, I don't want to think about that. But listen, people, every one of us will either be in heaven forever or the lake of fire forever. And it all depends, friend, what you do with it, what you do with Christ. Think about eternity, people. Never end. God wants to save you and God will save you if you thrust a shot. But if you go on in unbelief, if you go on fearful whatever, you, don't move it across the seat now, people, gently I tell you, and soft, you shall have your place. Imagine. People tell me place is my place and my position and where I work and what I have. Fair enough. If you die in your sin or if the Lord comes, Here's what the Bible says your part will be. In the lake. Say it softly, people. In the lake. What's burning? Where the beast, we were in the other chapter, it says, where the beast and the false prophet are and the deceiver of sinner, then you'll join them in the lake of fire. Father, we close our little meeting here in Ballychair, thankful for thy word. And we just ask thy blessing now upon thy word. We're glad for all that are listening and for the reverent attention. And we just pray that thou will bless thy word to these needy souls, any that are not saved. We pray for their salvation in the worthy name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.